Proudly We Served, sponsored by the Leland Legacy. I'm Al Bledsoe, veteran of foreign war, post 1108. Alan Paul from Richmond, Indiana. Jim Brown, director of veterans affairs uh, for uh, Mike Pence in Indiana. Tim Dyke, the director of training and service at Indiana Department of Veteran Affairs. I'm Matt Vincent, director of care for the Indiana Department of Veteran Affairs. We welcome you today to another session of Proudly We Serve, and uh, we're very pleased today and quite honored that we have these gentlemen with us. They're from Indianapolis, and uh, we'll start around the room here. And first, I guess I should go to my colleague that's helping today is Alan <laughs> yes. Paul and, and ask him how he is and how are things with him. Well, doing fine and uh, just sitting in today uh, with you, and I appreciate you asking me. And these gentlemen I work with, uh, during the session and, and work with them on Veterans Affairs and they all do a fine job. But uh, again, glad to be here and glad they could come to Richmond and look forward to them uh, talking about some of the new programs we have. That'd be great. Mr. Brown. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tell us what your day's like as the Director of Veterans Affairs in Indianapolis. Well, um, it normally starts with some emails and, uh, and then we, uh, our office is open to where uh, there are no, no doors shut unless we have a, a meeting that needs to have them shut. And so we discuss uh, uh, our main targets, which uh, basically for Indiana Department of Veterans Affairs and our directions given to us by Mike Pence when we took the job in January of 2013 is to help veterans. So we have our goals and our mission is uh, certainly that and so we work and and Tim uh, Dyke here works with uh, benefits and training uh, and the uh, 92 uh, county veteran service officers and uh, veteran uh, uh, various various uh, veteran service organizations mm -hmm. so and uh, and then also uh, Matt Vincent who they'll talk in just a second uh, they uh, he's concerned with uh, care which is uh, family relief is a good portion of that using TANF to help people in different ways that he'll explain and also a relationship uh, with um, the federal VA people confuse us with the uh, Indiana Department of Veterans Affairs that we have the ability to work federal issues we can work on federal issues but it's that's up to them so we uh, are advocates uh, and assist veterans there so our day is consumed with that and also uh, uh, the education of veterans and helping them out making sure that they get uh, going especially the ones that are reintegrating mm -hmm. and uh, then also a job placement and then working with this great team of 501c3s and uh, different entities in state government like the Indiana Guard and, and DWD. Mm -hmm. So our day is consumed with that walk-in business and, uh, and uh, emails and requests and then many, many outreach events that are total sure. over 300 a year. So that, you spread that out over 12 months and, and that's uh, what we do constantly, staying on the focus of those four items. Sure. Matt, what's the number one thing do you think with, with uh, caring for veterans? What's the number one issue out there right now? Well, the great thing about our operation is that we try to remain and sustain a one-stop shop for veterans. So we have veterans calling. Uh, sometimes it's like their VA health care. How do they get signed up? They don't know where to go, where to start. So, uh, you know, like Jim said, we can act as an advocate on their behalf. We aren't the federal VA, so we can't provide them that actual care, but we can help them navigate through the VA healthcare system. And, you know, we encourage people right when they get out of the military to sign up for VA healthcare. And after that, you know, they start finding the need for many other services, including like the Military Family Relief Fund, which is financial assistance for veterans that are struggling. 
currently, uh, right now, the legislation that was signed by Governor Pence a few months ago, uh, Senate Bill 295, opened the Military Family Relief Fund to, from post 9-11 veterans to all veterans that served during a combat period. So we're going to see an increase in the amount of applications we get for financial assistance because there is a need, mm -hmm. you know, that is outside of the current relevancy. And we, we hope to help and touch as many veterans as we can through that regard. And, you know, they can use that uh, for bills that they haven't been able to pay, their mortgage, electric bills, they need their car fixed to, you know, help them with employment. Uh, that's one of the bigger needs. And then, um, like I said, it's a one-stop shop. So if somebody comes in for that reason, then we will send them to um, our TANF team, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. They can provide services such as childcare and counseling, marriage retreats, and you know just that focus remains on the family, staying one, staying integrated. And then you know usually when they go from that point, they will go to our employment team. And if they're either underemployed, and you know they're working a job, but they're but they're better qualified, they can find mm -hmm. more substantial work. If they're overemployed, meaning they have two different jobs just to make ends meet, then we can help find them you know a stable job that's giving them the income of both those jobs combined. So with that said, you know, our main focus and my team's main focus is providing these direct services to help the veteran, you know, sustain a manageable lifestyle. Tim, you work with the service officers. Yes, sir. So um, it, it appears to me, uh, we have Pete on here, Pete McDaniels, our service officer. Mm -hmm. And it appears that, that the uh, learning uh, that Pete is going through or whatever he's going through with his schooling or whatever. It seems to be it's helping him a lot because um, uh, I just study people a lot and I noticed that he's grown a lot over the, just the last year that he, he has some answers to questions and uh, people like me come in and ask some of those stupid questions. So how is it to work around other guys that are in the service related field like you are uh, how do you help guys like that? I mean, well, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest resource we have is each other. In our last training session we did in May, we actually took almost an entire afternoon and did scenario-based training where the service officer was role-playing a veteran who first walks into the office and they were feeding off each other. We put them in small groups of about eight to ten people mm -hmm. and they kind of crossed ideas of how they do a claim or they point this veteran in the right direction on, on the benefits process or the health care process or any of the other myriad of things we do with employment like Matt was talking about the uh, TANF program and the military family relief fund. I think they really got a lot out of that last time because they got a lot of ideas that weren't just a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. and you're just reading the slide to somebody. They, they were able to exchange ideas and and format things the way others do it and take those ideas that would work in their office and then take it back and, and utilize that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown, tell me and help me understand what you do in relationship to the National, the Federation of Veterans Affairs. Um, where do you fit into that scenario? Can you? It, can you do anything at the state level, it, or is it more you've got to get federal approval to do some things, or can you, are you pretty much on your own, if you will, to make a decision to do that? Well, in our purview to mimic, if you would, the, uh, the federal VA, in that, uh, as you know, there's a lot of controversy out there that the VA is overwhelmed and um, doesn't hit everything on time and th there's a lot of complaints. So the first thing we do is with these services, that's why it's so important with uh, Tim and uh, the law 1387 that compelled each one of the county service officers to become accredited, then giving them training and accreditation and the tools to work directly to the VA to get claims done. Uh, so th there's one way into the Veterans Affairs is that the claims are done fully developed and they're successful in launching them into the system with a quick turnaround. Well, also in the, the need to reintegrate 
uh, with counseling and the veterans uh, uh, package for health care with all the turmoil in health care across the country, we work closely with the the area director for the VA is called the Vision, uh, and uh, that person we talk to now on a quarterly basis, but almost on a monthly basis. He's in charge of Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. So there used to be five of those directors feeding into Indiana. We were one of the states that were in, in the circumference of other states that mm -hmm. have big military installations. Well, it, didn't, it gave us five people to talk to about policy. Now we just have one for the most part. So we work closely with them and we tell them uh, things that are happening and things that they're changing, ways that they can correct business for Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so then, and then I mentioned uh, Matt uh, has a representative that's constantly at the VA installations. So then our influence, as you inquired, is that in these entities that we have an influence with the VA at a district level, these are the people that uh, uh, Eric Shinseki couldn't get fired okay. when he resigned. Well, <laughs> we have a fairly decent working relationship with them. Yeah. So then when we're not satisfied, we tell them about it. And uh, rather than throw stones at them to where we have people that need help. So I guess the best thing we do is we have a working relationship and understanding. Mm -hmm. We're prepared, these gentlemen and others, to, uh, to advocate on someone's uh, behalf for a claim that's long in coming or needs to be amended. Well then when we go to the, the uh, heads of the VA in this, in this area, they listen to us. So it's a relationship. At the same time, we work with our brothers and sisters in the uh, veterans service officers and the 501c3s and uh, the elected officials to where we actually come up and we have a voice for goodness because we're here to help the veteran only we're not the one like Matt mentioned. We are not empowered to make a federal decision, but we can sure help them correct or accelerate some. So with that relationship, that was one of the key things that uh, the governor wanted us to do. So uh, th that's it, is to keep the lines of communication going, and that's our strength. Uh, it isn't to bulldoze anybody, but th they know when they need to make corrections, yeah. and the VA has been beaten up over the last three years so much, and justifiably so, that they're now willing, if someone will approach them with some civility, to correct those errors one at a time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our effectiveness, and then we've had the governor's support and his representatives back in Washington that, that we have for Indiana mm -hmm. going over to these agencies, and in this instance, the federal VA to the building in going, hey, like that, yeah. so, so tying it all together. Well, communi communication. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alan, right. tell us about some of the bills that you helped with uh, while you were still sitting Well, <clears throat> on both of these, well, uh, when I was still there, that's now two years ago, <clears throat> believe it or not. But uh, like yesterday. Uh, we had, uh, well, they've had a number of things over the, over the years. I was trying to think, the governor the other day said that during his time as governor, he signed over 30 bills. Wow. And so it's kind of hard to pick one, but uh, the, the one that opened the fund up uh, that you're talking about, I think probably is the most uh, visible one that we've done. Mm -hmm. And we've done some things on education that I think uh, is important, uh, transferring of credits and so on, and still working on some of that. Uh, and I think that's important as people come back here to Ivy Tech and IU East, that more doors are open for mm -hmm. them. So I know in the upcoming year we're going to be working on some of those. It seems like um, in, in Indiana our communication is pretty good because, you know, it's, we don't hear anything nationally or, you know, uh, the news don't get a hold of something that some little tidbit leans to what he was saying. So uh, in what Tim's doing is communicating with these service officers, if you will, to keep the fire low, don't let fan it, you know, to to make sure that the veteran's taken care of. So what issue is do most service officers get into? What, If I'm a service officer, what am I going to come to you and say, look, I need this fixed? What, what kind of a problem? A lot of it is just the frustration with uh, the, a claim taking a long time. 
Um, what causes that? Now, I don't want to interrupt you, but it, what, it could be what a in a of sand hat causes it, that? I would think a lot of it stems from gathering the evidence that's required, especially if it's a disability claim. Mm -hmm. So you have to gather not only military medical service records, but civilian medical service records. You have oh, to wow. compile all that. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to extract things that aren't relevant to the claim, put that all together, and then it has to be sent to the records intake center. And there's piles and piles and piles of those things sitting mm -hmm. there. And a lot of times a veteran will get frustrated because it's been a couple weeks. Well, back when there was a backlog, some of those claims were taken, you know, 18 months to two years. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've since pretty much ate into that backlog. And now they're, they're stating that they're taking around 125 days. I want to that doesn't mean a whole lot yeah. if you're the veteran sitting there at 126 days, <laughs> but for the most part, um, that backlog has been eaten into. The other part that they get frustrated about if a claim was denied and it goes into the appeals process, because of the backlog being taken care of on the claims end, now there's a backlog in the appeals process. So the appeals process has taken up upwards of three years. So why can't we, 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 I don't want to interrupt you, but what can we do, because uh, we're talking to the veteran community today, so what, what can they do to speed that process up? Because to me, we need to try, and I don't know, but I, it would appear to me that we should be able to get from A to B without all this other maze going on out there. And a lot of times you can if it's a very simple disability claim that goes mm -hmm. through, they're being taken care of sometimes in a month or two. Mm -hmm. That would be um, excellent. It really that depends done. on the complexity of, of the uh, disability claim that they're seeking. When the more complex a claim is, I mean, that's why it takes a little longer, especially within appeals. But uh, fortunately for us, we've got a great working relationship with the Veter Veteran Benefits Administration, mm -hmm. the regional office in Indianapolis. So we've actually been able to call representatives from that office and, you know, get what's going on. Uh, with that particular claim and they'll say okay well here's here is why this appeal took so long they kept adding you know more and more evidence to it when at the same time they you know the appeal hasn't even been looked at but there's more more and more paperwork being thrown on top of it so you know we encourage the veterans to you know one step at a time let's get this done and then okay well that's done and you know and we can at least find out how long it's going to take, find out where it's at in the process, because one of the biggest things, one of the biggest frustrations is that, you know, they try to call some, somebody and they're not getting the right answers. So fortunately for us, like I said, it goes back to that communication and relationship mm -hmm. building is that, you know, we can get these answers. We can advocate on, be, on behalf of the uh, veteran. So Well, you guys seem to be uh, sitting here listening to what they're saying. They seem to be more proactive than, than if you just... You know, I can, I've had some experiences there with the VA where there was stall and delay and appeal and all this, put this in the appeal stack, put this in the delay stack, right. put this in the I'll call you in three months stack, rather than getting right to it. And that's what I'm trying to get focused on just a little bit is what causes that massive appeal and that massive backlog of things. What, what is causing that? Well, one thing I would say I just is, don't have the patience, yeah. I guess, to... Yeah. to, well, to you none can of tell us as veterans have yeah, really I mean, just don't have much patience <laughs> at all. Like, I want the answer now. One thing, and I'll, Please. I'll include myself in this, is uh, that you keep need to keep all your paperwork together yes. and be able Certainly. to bring it to bear and then know what your goal is. Why did you finally want to make an appeal uh, to get a disability claim or something else or amend? And then, as uh, Tim and, they, and uh, Matt both alluded to, if you asked for five things and if you would only asked for four, you probably would have a check each month. It was the fifth thing that threw it into two years because you asked for something that brought out a medical conclusion and they're not fast with that wow. and and then since we've been here the VA has gone totally computer so when we first made our visits up there they were still pushing paper around in in uh, carts over there with files big thick files and then the VA itself was just overwhelmed with the Vietnam claims mm -hmm. Korean World War II still around and then the current war as Matt mentioned um, brought up a number of different issues that they hadn't dealt with since really Vietnam 
on the type of claims and then these not new injuries but the approach to traumatic brain and that so it uh, it's that's why we're here today is to and thank you for sure. having us is to bring clarification a veteran if you're out there and listening today get your get your paperwork together and get back up in the attic and into that suitcase that you brought back from vietnam or mm -hmm. something and and get all that stuff ready and then get it to your county service agents so that they can help they are very well trained and that then this uh, doing a fully developed claim really accelerates stuff, and 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 so everybody's pretty well trained on that now. Don't bite off too much, or it goes into different compartments uh, there at the VA. Mm -hmm. We can't do anything about the way they operate, but we can help ourselves and the veteran by taking it one bite at a time. Sure. Another thing to take into consideration is is we have a lot of county service officers out there. But their budgets are all pretty much different. So a lot of times that's a one-person show. Mm -hmm. And they may have several thousand veterans in that county. Mm -hmm. And so a veteran's going to get frustrated if they can't reach that person by phone. Mm -hmm. And it might be because that, that in most cases they're with another veteran helping them. And they work long hours. And I'm sure many of them work beyond the hours that, are, that they are paid to work. They are very passionate about what they do, but there's only so much one person can do, and they still need to get sleep, they still need to eat, and they still have their own personal lives too. So I guess one of the things that we need to to push for is more support to the counties yeah. to get them that additional administrative help, probably in a lot of cases, maybe one or two or three county service officers in that county doing the same job with the staff but a lot of times they're undermanned and underpaid. And I think that's something for Thank this you. year that's, in the General Assembly yeah. that will be Why can't, uh, let me ask you a question then, why don't the state come in and take over the service officers like we have at Pete and Wayne County that does an excellent job. So why don't the state come in and say, okay, you're a service officer in Wayne County and you're servicing uh, 5,200 veterans or so, maybe? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to pay you uh, $5,000 a year for what you do. We don't care how long it takes you, but just get the job done. I mean, that's kind of the way I'd like to see it done, but is, is that the state intervening in something they shouldn't intervene and should they leave that locally but you know I don't think so I think it's getting the word out about um, you're, you're looking at dipping into a purse where it's it's locked for us so we have to find the key to open that up um, and in a lot of cases I think educating the counties on the economic stimulus that brings if a veteran is earning those benefits mm -hmm. And the payback is not like it is with property taxes or anything, but when, when that veteran starts getting that compensation or pension check every month, that, that stimulates that economy when you start getting 5,000 more veterans who have that particular sure. benefit. Uh, where are they spending that money? It's being spent in the county for the most mm -hmm. part, and it's being taxed after it's spent. Sure. So th that's something we want to get out there, that it, there's a payback. It's not immediate, but... You're, you're getting a payback and a return on your investment when you start hiring more of those people mm -hmm. to help these veterans get these benefits that they've earned. We found in the Senate office for a, a good many years that uh, the, the time there's just sheer numbers. It's just become overwhelming because certain people didn't get benefits and then they, they talk to other people and then they want them. Another thing we found was the if it was, let's say, in Vietnam and some people in Laos or wherever, getting those records from that period is almost impossible yes. and so I've, we used to help people kind of piece it together and maybe there would be one person left in that squad or platoon that remembered the incident but they'd have to find them run them down here in the states and yep. have them sign a paper or their company commander or platoon leader you said we, in we the states, it. this is a whole nation. I mean, yes. if, you're, if you're in the big army or the Marine Corps, I mean, to track down your friends from California, New York, or right. Florida, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's, so that's it's, very complex. It, yeah, and that's where frustration comes in yes. also because uh, let's say we get a name of somebody, platoon leader, we'd write them, and you wouldn't maybe get an answer for six months. Right, right. They were traveling wow. or whatever, and yes, I remember the incident, and they'd say, well, but he didn't put enough down about yeah. it. Yeah. 
<laughs> Just some of the stuff we run into. Sheer numbers. Yes, yeah, I understand. Al, I'd just say that uh, the state doesn't probably need to put state employees and get any bigger when mm -hmm. we have these heroes and management sections in each one of the counties. Mm -hmm. So as Tim mentioned, if the counties can reinforce this area, because mm -hmm. they do other things other than benefits, uh, and now they've concentrated collectively a lot more on the benefits, mm -hmm. but they help people get rides, all kinds of things. So if each county gets better and if there's legislation, then we'll see what the legislators do. Uh, they know the needs and then what the governor will sign. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but for us, I think we're playing catch up from other states. The laws are in effect now. We're awakened as a state mm -hmm. and we're doing quite well that way without making us bigger or the state bigger but use the local people uh, there in the community. Well I think Pete just really does an outstanding job mm -hmm. and I mean, like does. I say I've uh, watched people grow a lot and boy he's uh, to me he's really at the top of his game where he's got an answer uh, it may not be the answer you're looking for but he does have an answer so and I think uh, to a lot of veterans that's really kind of what it's important mm -hmm. so um, we're going to have to get ready and shut down um, this uh, doesn't last long enough. No, we're just it getting we started. Can go on. <laughs> so, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to thank everybody for showing up today, Mr. Brown, Tim, and Matt. Thank you for. We appreciate us. you guys coming. Thank you. And actually taking the time and, and Senator Paul for showing up today and helping out today. And I really yes, appreciate that, man. Thank it's been, you. Thank you. Been for great. Me. Yeah. Yes, sir. Been good. So, with that, we're going to say goodbye, and we'll see you next time.